All right, so chapter 18. And you must say it correctly. Money, 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 money. <laughs> uh -huh. So what we were talking about the first few chapters of, the, of this second half of the class was all leading up into really fiscal policy. Right? So we were really trying to get into and around what fiscal policy is. So fiscal policy, again, is government mucking around with spending and taxing. All right? And that's one way that we have of trying to correct the economy. All right? Now, another way to try and correct the economy is to use money instead of government spending or taxing. All right, so this chapter 18 is where we start into what's call, commonly called. All right? So before we can get into how we work with money and all those other fun stuff, We got to define it. I mean, money? right? I mean, it, 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 money. What is it? What does it do for us? All right. So it's got to have three properties, guaranteed properties. It must have, right? So one, it must be, and these are all very economist-type phrases, right? It must be a medium of exchange. In other words, why didn't they just say that? <laughs> well, that's what medium of exchange is supposed to mean, is that it's spendable. Right? So if you have something that's money, you must be able to exchange it for other things, any other thing. All right? So in the barter system, a lot of times people will come along and they'll say, well, if I've got this cow, will you trade it for me for a bunch of chickens? If it's cows and chickens, they might go for it. But if you break this cow in and say, well, I'm going to trade you this cow for the clothes on your back, you may say, no. Right? Well, partially because then you run around naked, that would be bad. <laughs> Potentially against the law, depending on where you were. But the idea, though, is that it has to be accepted pretty much anywhere. That's what it means. All right? Now, unit of account. Basically, this means it has to be measurable or have a number on it. So you will notice that all of our dollar bills that you have have a, a number on it to represent what it's worth. Right? So basically, it's, it's some measurable way of saying this is how much this is worth. All right. And then this last one that's a little bit vague, but store of value. In other words, it's got to hold its value. So if it's a dollar today, it better be a dollar tomorrow, and it had better be a dollar next year. And when you start running into situations where company, countries have hyperinflation, remember we talked about hyperinflation a while ago, where literally you could have inflation at the thousands of percents, where prices are doubling in literally you know, half a year. When that starts to happen, what happens to that country is their money starts to become not money because it doesn't store value anymore. Right? One of the things that Mexico had back when its peso was being devalued at a huge rate was that people were taking pesos and instead of actually using them to buy things, they were using to paper, wall their, to paper their walls. Right? So instead of buying wallpaper, it was cheaper to line the walls with a peso than it was to go to the store and buy wallpaper. I mean, that's how bad the inflation was, right? That, that a one peso bill was worth practically nothing. Right? And again, that was where the money started to lose its value. It became more important as a piece of paper than it was as the dollar it represented. Right? That's when money has lost its worth. Okay? So these three things must satisfy, must be satisfied in order for things to be money. All right? 
So classic question. Is a credit card considered money? Can we consider it money? Can you use it to buy things? Yes. So it is a medium of exchange. Check that one. Is there a unit of account? Is there an amount of money that you can borrow from this credit card? Yes, yes there is. There's a maximum amount you can use. Yeah, that very good. Check that one. Is it a store of value? Will you always be able to use that credit card forever? No. Why not? They all have expiration dates. That's exactly what makes credit cards not money. Expiration date makes it not money. So if anything fails any one of these three categories, you can't consider it money. Credit cards are debt. <laughs> not really. Oh yeah, true. But debt could be considered money, yeah. right? As long as you can spend it, it's okay. So some obvious things else that could be money. Gold. If you had an ounce of gold, would you be able to trade it for something else? Yes. Sure. Is it measurable? Yes, yes by its weight and its, its purity. And does it, if it's an ounce of gold today, will it be an ounce of gold tomorrow? No. Yeah, so is it, is it going to... It's still going to be an ounce of gold. Is its value going to be roughly the same from day to day to year to year? No. Not necessarily. But you could say the same thing about a U.S. dollar, right? True. So is the U.S. dollar not money either? Yes. Why is it money? US. So that doesn't mean anything. If it's not storing its value, then it can't be money. We shouldn't be using it as such. So the storing of value, it just has to keep its value Relatively, right? I mean, an ounce of gold, right? If you bought it 10 years ago, it's worth a, a buttload more now than it was 10 years ago, right? I mean, 10 years ago, gold was five, $600 an ounce. Now it's $1,300 an ounce. And silver's tanking. Well, gold's tanking, too. I mean, it yeah, used to be $1,600 an ounce. Now it's only fourteen. It's gone down $200 in the last month and a half, right? I mean, so... Yeah. Huh? So this store of value thing, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's a little bit vague, it, it just has to keep a relative store of value to some degree, because nothing has the exact same value from one day to the next, period. Even the US dollar does not, right? Because what you could buy for a dollar this year is not the same as what you could buy from a dollar last year. Okay, so it's money. It's still money. Gold is still money, yeah. So unfortunately, credit cards aren't, because yes, there is an ex explicit expiration date that says, at this stage, the store of value is gone. Right? And if that credit card doesn't get renewed, y y you may as well cut it up. All right. Now, money does have to do a few other things just to be safe. <laughs> One, it does need to be at least a little bit scarce. Right? It can't grow on trees. If money grew on trees, it would, it would not be money. If money was a grain of sand where you could just walk out to the beach and grab a whole handful of it and go spend it, it still would not be money. Just a little bit too much sand. But scarce, but still have enough of it to simplify buying. In other words, there, money has to be available enough that you can use it. Right? And this is part of the reasons why sometimes people say, well, gold doesn't really work that well as money. It satisfies all of the definitions, but unfortunately, it's a little too scarce. And it doesn't simplify the buying process. right? I mean, we could, if we wanted to, go out and start minting gold coins and saying that this gold coin, which weighs a tenth of an ounce, is worth $200. But you know, how are you going to make a, a, a gold coin that's only worth, say, 50 cents to 10 cents down to a penny? That's tough. <laughs> You're talking about fractions of an ounce of gold that represents a penny. It, it, 
again, it's not simplifying it enough, which is often why countries quit using gold to do their buying process. All right? So they said, let's create these bills and use them instead. All right? So <laughs> yes and no, depending on how you look at it. Um, so when you create money, you can create, again, creating money is as simple as saying, I'm going to print up bills or I'm going to mint coins and say that this is money. Back when this country first got into its existence and was getting large enough to be considered a group of, of you know, sort of co-unional states, each state created its own money. So each state was minting its own coin, saying this coin is worth this many dollars or this many you know, pounds, really, because really we were still kind of a, a, a British tied unit more than anything else. We created, we created pence and we created tuppence and we created pounds. And we minted them ourselves. So these, we said these were from Pennsylvania, these were from New York, these were, et cetera. Okay? And the only reason that those coins were worth anything is because they were actually minted out of gold and silver, literally. So they just basically took the gold and silver that the state had and to make them into coins. That type of money, that's known as commodity money. Money that has another intrinsic, which great word, use other than being money. In other words, you could take gold and silver and use it to make jewelry, to, you know, produce certain types of, uh, uh, of wheels that need gold or silver plating in order to be useful, whatever, right? You could make a gold-plated cup, you could make a silver-lined glass, what have you. So it had other uses. So commodity money is any money that has another intrinsic value or can be traded for those items. The way that they use spices? Kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, I mean y if you think about uh, the Native Americans, right, they used to use beads, right, wampum. Right? That, was, that was their money th back then. They would create beads and they would say, well, if you had a purple bead around your neck, it was worth X number of cattle or chickens or you know, bushels of corn, what have you. All right? So for us, when those gold or silver coins were minted, they were true commodity money. Now, a little bit later on in our history, when we created the first United States of America, what we did is we actually said, okay, instead of minting gold and silver coins, they said, look, that's way too British. We need to be different, all right? And in order to be different, we started to print money. We wanted it to be different enough that it wouldn't be somehow tied to the British because we were like, look, we are now, we're not us, we're not a thing, we're our own country, dang it. So we're going to print our own money. But the way we printed the money is we said, okay, this bill, so do I actually have any money? No, I do not. Dang, my wife stole all my cash. So let me borrow. Let me borrow a bill. If you pull out a C note, I'm gonna hurt you. <laughs> Alright, so <laughs> I'm going to turn this twenty dollar bill up and oh, no, I'm not a magician. Um, but this dollar bill, it represented our independence. And so what we wanted to say was that this is going to be not worth pounds, it's instead going to be worth dollars. Right? So that's why we actually printed on here how many dollars it was actually worth. Uh, note is legal tender. We'll get to that one in a little bit. But there, yeah, $20. The word is always down there, right? And again, the dollar was purely to say we're not pounds anymore, right? But the way the dollars were printed back in the, the U.S. first started was that the dollars actually said $20 silver note or gold note. And what that meant was that this bill represented your ownership of some of the United States gold reserves or silver reserves. And at any time, you could take this dollar bill, whatever, whatever denomination it was, go to any US bank and say, I want to trade it in for the gold or silver that you're carrying. 
and they would go into the back and measure out however many this ounces of gold or silver this was worth and give it to you, right? I mean, if you think about it, you could have, most of our buying and selling was done using straight gold and silver, but how many people do you know running the grocery store had a, a you know, a scale to measure your silver to determine if your silver was pure or your gold was pure? You understand what I'm trying to get at, right? And walking around with two pounds of gold, is that a good idea? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Right? But walking around with bills, right? you could hide it in your shoe, you could hide it in your hat, you could hide it in the back pocket. Right? So you could be wealthy and no one would notice, necessarily. Right? So this, is, this, this was still commodity money at that time. Okay? So even though it was a printed bill, and this bill wasn't really worth anything, you could still trade it directly for that item that it represented. Okay? So that actually is commodity money. If you have silver notes, technically, if it was pre-1965 or something like that, there was some stage, I think it was 30 years when we switched off the gold and silver standard, that you could continue to trade those in for US gold or silver. Right? So nowadays, actually, you can't. By law, they have dictated it's not doable. Now, the other type of money that you can have, which is what we have nowadays, folks, is what's known as fiat money. Brandon, did you already put that bill away? Just bring out a one this time. You make me nervous. <laughs> nice. All right. So this money nowadays is not commodity money. You can't go in and trade it for gold or silver. And in order to actually make it worthwhile, what the US government has done is printed on this bill this phrase, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Every U.S. bill has that phrase printed on it to indicate that by law, this is money. Nothing backs this money up, folks, other than the fact that we believe it's worth a dollar. This is as good as religion, folks. Right? If you didn't believe in the United States, you shouldn't carry these things around because they are worthless if you don't, period. Because the only thing that's keep keeping them able to be used is the fact that we believe in the US government. Right? Fiat money is money that is backed by law instead of a commodity. Nineteen thirty four, that's when the US government switched from having our money backed by gold where we could only print as much money as we had gold sitting in our reserves, right? So if Fort Knox didn't have another ounce of gold, we couldn't print any more money, right? The nice part about that is that our, gold, our money supply, very fixed. You could be getting US dollars would never be more than a certain amount of gold that's sitting in our vaults. Now, the value of the gold may go up, and that may allow us to print some more money, but that's it. It's, it's strictly tied to that gold or silver or platinum or whatever we had in the vaults that we used, okay? But now, not the case. Our money is fiat money. So the only reason it's any good is because you believe. Schrodinger's dollar? <laughs> well, I mean, essentially, yeah. If you don't believe, you shouldn't carry around dollar bills, period. You should only carry around gold and silver and platinum, and you should be trading in gems and, and jewels, and that's it, right? I mean, it still works, right? I mean, you could probably go to a store and say, look, I'll give you this Rolex watch for that fur coat, right? They probably would do it. You would find someone willing to do it. Of course, the way they would do it is that it would take the Rolex and say, how much is this worth? They would go get that much money's worth of it and then use that money to buy the coat and then give you the coat. And of course, what would you do with the difference between the two? Mm -hmm. There's there some people that that's the way they work. They don't believe in the US dollar and so they don't. They only trade in gold and silver and they have to have someone in between them all the time who will convert it into US dollars buy stuff and then convert it back. Well, it's the same as going to any other foreign country, right? I mean, when I was in, when I was in Dubai a little bit ago, I was over there over Christmas break, right? I mean, I walked around with US dollar bills. Could I spend them? Sure, if, somebody would take them. if someone would take them, right? But would any of the stores take them? No. I had to convert them into the Dubai currency, whatever it was at the time. Dumas, I think. I mean, again, I mean, that 
basically I had to pay the bank to be the guy who walked around with me and said, convert my money into their money. And that's the way it works, right? And again, the only reason it's money is because they believe in it, I believe in it, and I believe in their money, and they believe in their money, right? There's nothing back in it, though. It's all just belief. Right? So if you've got faith, you can continue to buy and sell things. If you don't, well, <laughs> that's why when people say they don't believe in anything, I'm like, really? <laughs> Have you ever spent the dollar bill? Then yes, you do. Because right? this is what it is. It's nothing other than the fact that the US government has told us it's worth what it is. And if you don't believe them, then maybe it's not. Yeah, well, that's why it's kind of it's kind of close to faith money, right? Mm. So my question to you is, how many countries do you think still have this commodity type money? How many? Think. How many countries? Or? Countries. Yeah, I mean, think about countries that mint their own money. Do you think England still mints its money based on the amount of gold and silver it has? No. Yeah, no, they, they stopped in about 1962. But they were one of the last ones. They were the longest one to hold on to the gold and silver standard, right? There are almost no countries left that have commodity money anymore. Almost everyone's money is strictly faith-driven. Belief. If you believe in our governmental system, then you believe in the fact that our money is worth something. Otherwise, well, maybe it's not kind of cool if you think about it and kind of scary Terrifying. at the same time <laughs> all right so so we have a certain amount of money in our system So people will talk about the amount of supply of money in the system. So first off, the definition of the money supply in the system is a little bit weird. So bear with me to some degree as I define how money is actually measured by the government. All right. First, this, the name is great. This is, I love this. Again, it's because I'm a mathematician. Money is defined by the phrase M1. So when people start talking about the money supply, they will talk about M1, M2, which for me, it's just absolutely flipping hilarious because it's a very mathematical way of talking about it, right? I mean, M1 is the first definition of the money supply. So cash is normally what we consider to be the money supply, right? But I mean, what else do we spend liquidly, right? I mean, think pre-1980s, when you went to the grocery store, would you walk into the grocery store with $100 in cash? Yeah. You would write a check, right? And that was a quick transfer of money from your account into the grocery store's account. Very spendable, liquid money, right? So first off, Anything that is liquid or quickly spendable. So the first definition of M1, there's a C in there, I, sw I swear, is they said add up all the cash that's in the system. So all the dollar bills and all of the coins, add them all up. And then add up all of the money that's in everyone's checking accounts, right? And again, the government had track of everything in everyone's checking account. They all do right now, still. And technically, there's one more thing in, in M1. So cash we can spend, checking account money we can spend at our own grocery stores. What else do we spend, but we use it in foreign countries? Uh, Traveler's checks. Uh -huh. You got to be old school to know those. And you have to spell old school style, too. I've had traveler's checks. First time I went, to, uh, first time I went overseas, my wife and I traveled to Turkey. We went and stayed in Istanbul for, for two weeks, and we bought like five or $600 worth of traveler's checks. And they, they literally are spelled like this, too. Don't ask me why, but all of them are the old English style of spelling checks. It's really weird, but that's the way they all do it. Right? 
checks. If you ever go and you buy some of them, if you're ever going to go overseas, you know, get some traveler's checks, just because they're kind of cool. I mean, nowadays, what do you do when you go overseas? Yeah, you just use a credit card, and you let the credit card do the conversion for you instead of doing it yourself, right? Because what you do with traveler's checks is you go over to the foreign countries, you trade, you go to the bank. You have to actually go to the flipping bank, which is hilarious. I strongly encourage going to banks in foreign countries because it's weird. I mean, it's weird. It's just different. And you got to go up, and you have to buy, and they have to get your passport out to believe that you really are the person whose name is on the traveler's check. It's, it's a process. It's like going to the grocery store in a foreign country. We always go. Anytime we go to a foreign country, first place we go, grocery store. Because there's just, I mean, oh, the products are so weird, and the money is weird. Oh, it's, it's just good stuff. Anyways. <clears throat> they come to make fun of you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I mean, it, it, it's understanding how other countries have to deal with, with standard purchases that they make every day, right? I mean, as an economist, that's something I want to know. I mean, here, I know what it takes to go out to the store and buy something. Is it the same way everywhere else? Some places it is. Other places, uh-uh, it's a lot harder. Right? I mean, it's a, some places it's a real pain in the butt to go to the store. It's like when I, was in, when I was in Germany, yeah, you could go to the store just like here and just buy crap, right? When I was in South America, hell no, it was a pain in the ass, right? They, <laughs> I was, I'm like, wait, I have the money, and they're like, well, I must see your passport. I'm like, why? You're a street vendor trying to sell me a T-shirt that says Paraguay on it. Why would you care whether my, whatever. Anyways, okay, so I wanted to make sure that I was understanding how cash travels in the, in the rest of the world than just here, which is kind of cool. So this was our first definition of cash, and that lasted until about 1985, all right? But what the, uh, the caretaker of the money supply said was that that's not good enough to really represent the money that is available to be spent any time. Right? So as we got more mature in our spending habits, we said, wait a second, we need to create a second level of the money supply. And again, because they're mathematical economists, it, I assume they were anyways, they created the second level of the money supply. Currently, folks, this is what is used by the Fed to measure our money supplies, M2. So to measure this amount of money that's available to be spent, start with the stuff that's up here. So that's still in it. They didn't take anything out. Take anything out. They just added stuff. Now, when we created credit cards, what did we create right after credit cards, relatively quickly thereafter? Debit cards. Debit cards. What are our debit cards connected to? Debit cards. And savings accounts. In fact, most debit cards are directly connected to savings accounts and not checking accounts. And what banks started doing was saying, oh yeah, you can have a checking account or a savings account, but we're just going to tie them both together to the same thing anyways. And when you write a check, it comes out of the savings account. And when you use your debit card, it comes out of the savings account. Same difference. Now, the Fed, or the people who are keeping track of the money supply, were looking at this saying, you know, all of these checking account dollars, they keep going down. The amounts in checking accounts have dropped for the past 20 years, every year. Amounts in our savings accounts has actually been creeping back up. And what it used to be telling the Fed was that people were saving more money, right? I mean, that's what they thought. <laughs> smack, smack, smack. No, 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 no. We were just putting it somewhere else that we had quick access to, right? So what they did is they said, OK, we understand this debit card stuff. So not only are checking accounts in the money supply, but so are savings accounts, because you guys have direct access to them. Right? If you think 1980s, 1970s, in order to get at your savings account, you actually had to go to the flipping bank and fill out a form that said, transfer you know, $1,000 from savings into checking. I mean, that's what it took to do it. You didn't hop on the computer, type in a couple of passwords, and then say, do it automatically, right? I mean, it was a flipping process. Every time you did it, it, it sucked. Right. Oh, God. <laughs> exactly. You get an app where you just push one button and then hit three numbers, and there goes $100 from one side to the other, right? I mean, it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's. It, good and bad, right? Good and bad. Good because we have easy access. Bad because, well, we have easy access. <laughs> all right. And the worst thing about it was that the Fed was watching all of this money and how much people were spending, and they discovered that Ooh. 
not only were people pulling out money from checking accounts and savings accounts much easier and spending them at, re at you know, at basically at will, is they were also doing this with short-term CDs, right? So if you have a certificate of deposit, which is basically like a savings account where you have automatically said, I'm going to leave this $2,000 in the bank for a year, I promise, and I'm going to earn better interest because I promise not to spend it. Can we wait to spend it? No, we weren't doing it. Even though we would spend, we, we would buy a $5,000 certificate of deposit that wouldn't mature until one year, when we wanted something, we would just cash in and say, ah, screw the interest, we don't care. I want to, you know, I need a new yacht right now, so let me cash this $100,000 CD in and, and go buy a yacht. Again, this is, this is, I mean, the Fed did enough analysis to see that these sorts of items were actually in the money flow. They were getting spent just too regularly for them to ignore anymore, right? So this is the newest definition for M2. Technically, there is an M3 out there. So if you look up what the money supply is, you will see some websites talk about M3. This actually includes, well, M1 and M2, of course. Everything builds on where it was before. Also, non-tax IRAs are included in it. In other words, if you're investing in an IRA, but it's not a tax-free IRA, people are cashing those in as cash regularly as well. So you can invest in an IRA or a, a mutual fund or a stock fund. And as long as it's not one of those tax-deferred mutual funds where you take a penalty for, for taking the money out, that's considered cash to a lot of people as well. This is not standardly used, but it is reported on on a regular basis. So this is generally what I consider the money supply, and the Fed does too. Now, what is not in the money supply then? But it is really money, right? Or it's money that you have access to that you could spend at some stage. Longer terms, so longer term certificates of deposit. So if you buy a five year CD, that's actual true investment on your part. The government accepts that the money that's sunk into that is sunk. You're not going to take it out and spend it. Any government security, so U.S. savings bond, U.S. government security, U.S. treasury note, all of those sorts of things are also not in the money supply. They're not being spent. And the reason why is that these are generally what banks hold as collateral, as equity. So anybody who's holding a government security, the whole point of them holding it is to say, I'm worth at least this much money because it's in government money, not necessarily in my own internal assets. Okay. So this is really all there is that's out there that we could consider ourselves having money. And obviously, there's other stuff out there, right? I mean, the gold and silver that you guys have sitting in your vaults. I assume everybody has some, right? Yeah. Me neither. But um, <laughs> in theory, there are. You know, my cousin and my brother-in-law both have like, like half a pound of gold that they have sitting at the safe deposit box at the bank, right? And they hold it because it's, it's essentially to them cash, but not in the money supply, right? Hmm? Good stuff. And that will be important later on when we talk about how the money supply affects the economy. Okay, so this, what, this is what defines money to some degree and how it's looked at in the system. Now, who controls this? Uh, very good. <laughs> Controller of money supply. So who's policing it, if you will?
Federal Reserve System, often just called the Fed. Okay, so when people say Fed, what they're talking about is the Federal Reserve System. Okay, they are the caretaker of the money supply. Now, interesting notes about the Fed. Created in 1913 by Woodrow Wilson. So what was going on in the late 1800s, early 1900s, was that the US was going through a great series of um, bank panics, bank runs, and bank closes. So what was happening in the US economy was that lots of people were, were starting to, to accumulate wealth. And when you accumulate wealth, the idea is that you want to be able to hold on to it. And you don't want to hold on to it in the mattress at your home because, well, that's not really all that safe. So what we wanted was a system where we could hide and hold that wealth that would be secure. And that's what the banking system was. Right? In addition, it also provided for the economy to borrow money and purchase things on credit so that it could grow faster. So the government was very happy that the banking system existed. But it, had its, it did not have its hands in the banking system at all. Right? The US government had tried twice before 1913 to create a US national bank. And both times, after 10 to 15 years, we dissolved it. Okay? So there were US national banks pre-1913. But they were actual true national banks. They were run by the government. Well, in 1913, Woodrow Wilson, who was a, a, a big historical president. He knew the history of the US. And so he knew that the US had made two national banks and they'd failed. And they'd cost the US government a great deal of money. And he's like, OK, look, we need, to, we need something to regulate these banks to protect ourselves from these bank closures where people just lose all of their money. Because what was going on was bank presidents were saying, oh, crap, you know, we've, we only have $20,000 in gold in our vault, and we've got $50,000 worth of deposits, and now all of these people are coming to the bank to take their money out, and we don't have it. And when that happens, what do you as a banker do back in 1913? That's right. You get on a horse, you ride away as fast as you can. Okay? And you usually you have the $20,000 of gold on your back as you're riding, and you're trying to be sneaky. Because if they find you, yeah, usually it's a mob. You're lynched. Okay? And then they theoretically divide the gold up, but usually it goes to the robber who killed the guy. Right? But I mean, literally, that's what was going on. And it happened in you know, 30, 40, 50 different banks throughout the, the US at the time. So Woodrow Wilson said, OK, in 1913, he's like, all right, we need something to govern our banks. We're going to make the Federal Reserve System. And we are going to make it autonomous. So in other words, the US government gave away the right to control its own money supply. Imagine yourself being president and having control over everything the government spends and everything the government prints money-wise. And you gave it up. Could you do it? I mean, think about what's going on right now. Do you think any of the presidents that have come around in the last 40 years would have given up the power to print money? Bushes, the Clintons, the, 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 the Obamas, any of those guys? No. Hell no. There were a couple of times where they tried to dissolve the charter, and it, it didn't go through. Right? But this, 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 Woodrow Wilson actually almost quit after he created it. If you, if you read his memoirs, you'll talk about how he almost resigned as president after signing this into law because he gave away the power to control the money supply. And that was very scary. Right? He handed it to bankers. <laughs> right? So <laughs> scary. But again, he took a leap of faith that Somebody needed to be watching over the banks. Because what happened when all of those banks closed was that the growth in the economy tanked. And all the government spending that we tried to do to make up for it didn't help. It just it couldn't make up for the difference that people had lost thousands of dollars at the snap. right? And then it all went to Mexico and 
actually to the west, which wasn't the US yet. Right? So it was a little bit scary. So he created it. He created it to be individual. And it was, you know, it was its own entity, right? So its job was to safeguard the banking industry. That was its job. So to solidify banks as needed. That is a seriously good point, OK? So please note that the Fed is not run by the government, period. It's got its own board of directors. It's got its own board of governors that run the entire industry separate from the government. Now, it's not completely divorced from the government, right? I mean, it, it <laughs> there's still a couple of strings attached, right? But It does report to Congress twice a year, but all it does is report. It tells Congress what it's doing. That's it. So twice a year, Ben Bernanke has to go up in front of the, uh, the House Ways and Means Committee and say, this is what the Fed's doing. Technically, they can ask him questions and grill him and try and make him uncomfortable so that he would do what they want him to. Generally speaking, the Fed chairman doesn't have to listen. Right. There's been lots of screaming for transparency in the Fed over the last few years. And honestly, I wish it would be less transparent so that people would just accept that banks are going to exist and they're going to make money and that's, let's let it happen. All right. But whatever. So they do report to Congress. There are 12 central banks. So the first initial 12 that were created back in 1913, if you want to see, I forget what page it's on, page 380 or something like that, 400. Yeah, page 400 has the map of where these the banks were created. So please note where most of the United States business was taking place back in 1913. Over there on the East Coast, that's where almost all business was taking place. That's why there's only one central bank for the entire West Coast, right? Because back in 1913, California hadn't really boomed yet. There was a gold rush, but basically once people got the gold, they shipped it out to the East Coast, and that's where they spent it. <laughs> Whatever. So over the last few years, as the economy has shifted and banks have been more necessary out on the West Coast, They've created 25 new member banks. Most of those member banks are in these underrepresented regions in this map. So most of the new member banks are out in California, the Midwest, and Texas, basically. I think there's three member branches in Texas by itself, just because Texas has lots of oil money. But again, the Board of Governors for the Fed is made up of the bank presidents of these 12 banks. Fed is run by the Board of Governors. That's, there's not two O's in board. Board of Governors. It's a 12-person committee, or a 13-person committee. Six are uh, central bank presidents. Six are appointed by the president for a 14-year term, which is relatively interesting. The president can appoint anyone he wants. They can be potentially partisan if they want them to be. And then one chairman who is again appointed by the president, but he's only appointed by the president for four years.
and appointed on off election years. So presidential elections happen every multiple of four years, so 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012, et cetera, et cetera. The, federal, the, the Fed chairman is appointed 2002, 2006, you know, so the opposite even years when the president is being elected. And again, the president can pick whoever he wants technically, but very rarely does the president actually change the chairman, which has been kind of cool, right? I mean, prior to Ben Bernanke, who is, right, that's the current one, Ben Bernanke. Looks like it should be pronounced Ben Bernanke, but it's Ben Bernanke. He's been the Fed chairman for the past six years. Nobody necessarily likes him, but that usually means that, he's doing yeah, he's doing a good job. <laughs> the Fed chairman should be hated in general. Uh, prior to Ben Bernanke, probably one of the most famous ones, because he was the head, the chairman of the Fed for 32 years, Alan Greenspan. He was the one who basically ushered in the monetary theory policies that the Fed has been practicing over the last 30 some odd years. He was a stud. I actually heard him speak live back before he started to get really old. And he was, I mean, at 60, he was quick, sharp, and he was a mean SOB, big time. But again, to, to run the Federal Reserve, that's kind of what you had to be. So this is, this is how the board is set up. Mo notice that most of the times, ha at least half of it is, is appointed. The other half is run by the bank presidents. And this chairman, eh, again, the chairman is just the head. He's the person who actually just reports what these 12 people decide to do. All right? So he doesn't have a, a he or she does not have a deciding? No, nope, they don't actually vote. Yeah, they don't actually vote on the board. They're just the representative. They're the person who gets flayed whenever there's a problem. Yeah, uh huh. They're, they're the one that gets put up in front of the firing squad if there's a problem. But it's really these guys that should be the ones that should do it. And the scary thing about it is that I think at least two of these positions have not been appointed in the last six years. So there's two open spots right now on the, on the federal, on the Board of Governors that haven't been filled. There's some process that they have to be approved by the Senate or the Congress, blah, blah, blah. And of course, given our current situation with our Senate and our Congress, they couldn't approve what the, you know, the color of the sky was if they, you know, if they all sat down and were going to die tomorrow to agree on it, right? I mean, whatever. So that's the Fed. The Fed is the caretaker of our money supply, all right? Now, um, when the Fed first started, the government gave banks the ability to become essentially charter banks in the Fed. Initially, only about 10% of the banks in the United States agreed to sign up and be a part of the Federal Reserve System. 10%, that was it. But that was enough. It was enough to keep our banking system relatively stable. But what the Fed has been doing over the last few years has been trying to get all of the other banks to join in. And again, it wasn't necessarily a, you know, it's still, even today, only 40% of banks are actually in the Federal Reserve System itself. That doesn't mean the, federal, the Fed doesn't control all of the other ones, but only 40% of them actually are a Federal Reserve. We'll talk more about that in a bit. So, what's the goal of the Fed? No, actually, all the the the, the Fed is actually a nonprofit organization, folks. They take all the money that they earn and donate it back to the Treasury. So making money is unimportant to the Fed. They do make money, by the way, though. They do make it. They give it back to the country, though. So the Fed is a caretaker of the macro economy. What's the goal of the macro economy? What was that? What was that? Full employment. Yeah, that's one of them. Stable prices. Stable prices. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What's the third one? Economic growth. All right, very good. Never hurts to go back and review the very first day of the second half of the semester, right? 
These are the goals of the macro economy. So the government's job is to do these three things. The Fed's job, exactly the same thing, period. So it's actually written in the charter of the, of the Fed that these are its goals, to take care of the macro economy. That's its job. Now, the government does this with spending and taxing. Fed does this by playing with money. Sometimes you just have to swim in it, folks. So the Fed every now and then will fill up an entire swimming pool full of cash, and their entire board of governors must swim through it to the other side. That's an urban myth. I don't believe it, but supposedly it happened once. It'd be kind of cool if you think about it. Swimming through money to get to the other side. <laughs> well, they, they got a few. <laughs> they made sure the bills were old so it wouldn't be that bad. <laughs> All right, so the question is, how does the Fed do it? Well, that's actually chapter 19, which we're not going to get to quite yet. But what I want to point out is that this is what's known as fiscal policy. This is known as monetary policy. So again, when you are listening to news reports and you hear someone talking about fiscal policy, they're talking about the government. Straight up, it's got to be some branch of government. When they talk about monetary policy, they must be talking about the Fed, period, because they are the caretaker of the money policies here in this United States. Now, they may be talking about the money supply or the money policies throughout the world. Then they're talking about the International Monetary Fund, which is basically the same thing as the Fed, except it's for the world instead of just for the US. Basically the same thing, though, OK? All right, so blah, 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 blah. All right, so so the Fed's job is, one, to, to take care of the macro economy. That's one of them. What are its other jobs? OK, well. So let's write that one down first. Take care of M2, which is the money supply. And again, we will talk more about manipulating the money supply in a little bit. Now, the other thing that the Fed has to do, any check you write, in fact, any electronic file transfer that you perform is also going to be governed and done by the Fed. So when you write a check or you transfer money to someone else, what happens is that your bank never actually does anything. All it does is it sends a note with the routing numbers for the bank that you're taking the money from and the bank that you're depositing the money to and sends it to the Fed. And the Fed gets to those two banks' records and says, if they're different banks, right? I mean, sometimes the routing numbers are for the same bank. But literally, all it does is it says, OK, I took this money from this bank account, and I put it into this bank account, period. And they're purely bank accounts owned by those banks at the Fed level. They then send the bank a report back with the routing number saying we did this, and it's the bank's job to report back to you that the Fed did this for them. So any bank is really just a big, huge, glorified spreadsheet manipulator. The Fed actually does all of the actual real transfer of dollars, period. That's their job. All right. So anytime there's a screw up at your bank, the, the screw up is simply because the, the bank did not read properly what the Fed did, or they told the Fed improperly what to do. Right. And this is how counterfeiting in checks works, right? is that counterfeiters find out routing numbers for Federal Reserve banks. This is why those numbers are kind of relatively protected nowadays, right? So that you can create checks as long as they have the right type of ink and the right type of paper 
if you send it to the Fed, the Fed will start transferring money between accounts. So if you know how to print the right type of check and the right type of ink, it can work. And it's been done many times. This is why the ink is constantly rotated through now when they print out actual paper checks. All right, so clearing checks, it's one of its jobs. Um, the other ones you should probably expect, right? Technically, they are also regulating banks. And the reason that they're regulating banks <laughs> is to protect, theoretically, us. I mean, that's the Fed's job. When it's regulating a bank, it's not doing it to, to impose taxes on the bank or to piss the bank off. It's really there so that the bank won't be able to screw us. Right, because essentially their goal is these three goals. And whether a bank makes money is unimportant to the Fed. The Fed cares, right? If a bank fails, the Fed actually is unhappy because that means that there is going to be less economic growth. Because now that bank can't loan out money so that Jason can buy a new house. Right, Jason? You can buy a new house? Would you because you wouldn't buy anything used, right? Yeah. Good man. That's absolutely right. OK. Other thing that the Fed obviously has to do is uh, maintain cash. So in other words, circulate money, except printed money, physical cash. They don't actually do the printing. Um, the government still owns the actual printing rights. But the Fed is who dictates when the printing is done. And they do the destroying of dollars when new, print, new money is printed. So the Fed will only destroy new money when it prints money for it, right? I mean, you guys know that money gets burned on a regular basis, right? Because that's the Fed's part of their job. When there's money is old and there's too much cocaine on it, they have to throw it into the incinerators, burn it, and then make new ones. That's the number one residue on a $100 bill, folks. It's not sweat or blood or tears. It's literally cocaine. Don't, don't, I mean, just I'm that. surprised they can afford $100 bills if they're just okay. <laughs> I, it's just one of those weird things that the Fed, you know, the Fed, when it burns the money, right, it, it, has to, it has to clean the air that it's burning. And the number one material that it had to filter out of the burning of these dollar, $100 bills was Coke. <laughs> However they did it, I don't know. But <laughs> Uh-huh, yeah. That it tells you how new it is. <laughs> All right, one of the other things that the Fed has to do. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good idea. Oh, they also have to keep track of the U.S. gold reserves. So if you, look, if you ever go to the, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, which is where most of the gold that we used to have, or I mean that we have, sits, it, it, and it, it is used to. Most of the gold that's sitting inside of the vault at the bank in New York is actually owned by other countries. And in fact, the the the, the branch bank in New York, the Federal Reserve Bank in, in New York that houses all this gold, they make about ten to fifteen million dollars a year insuring all of the gold for the other countries that they hold. I mean, literally, they, the, the, other, the, the world pays the, you know, the Fed $15 million to take care of their gold because they bought it all from us. The US only has a, you know, a, a few you know, 50, 60, 70 pounds worth of gold. The rest of the world has thousands. But it's spread throughout all of their different vaults. If you ever get a chance to go to the Fed in New York, definitely go and reserve time to go see the gold vaults because it's cool as That is awesome stuff because it's gold and it's, you, I mean, you don't get to walk down into the halls, but you can actually see them moving piles of it. And that's literally what other countries will do. They'll say, Japan will say, oh, I need to pay Germany you know, a trillion dollars in gold. And so the Fed will go down and, and you know, pull out a cart and put a trillion dollars worth of gold in it, move it out of Japan, three vaults over, put it into Germany, drop it down, and then move along. And they have to video the whole thing so that they, both countries know that that's what was going on cool shit, right? I mean, most of it, like I said, most of it's not ours, though, because we sold it a long time ago. 
but yeah, we hardly have any as a country. Yeah, it's, it's not worth anything, right? It's and it's it's it's, it's bulky. It's it's and it's easily stolen, right? We I mean, faith money. that's right. Our money is already ba is based on faith, not on gold. We don't need gold to be powerful. We just need belief. All right, so these are, the, goal, these are the, the, the things that the Fed actually has to do. Now, you may wonder, OK, Marshall, you said that only 10% of banks join the Fed. Well, that's true. And that even currently, only 40% of banks are actually branch banks of the Fed. That means that 60% of them out there are not. First of all, the way you can tell that a bank is a part of the Federal Reserve System is that they have the name national somewhere in their title. That actually means that they've signed a charter with the Federal Reserve. All right, so first national bank, that's a Fed bank. First note. OK? So look for the word national. That means that they're part of the Fed. Does, does it make them any more safe than any other bank? No. <laughs> and the reason why is the 1980 Monetary Control Act. So in the late 70s and, and early 80s, very early 80s, mostly in the 70s, was the last time that we had a, a US banking crisis prior to 2008, that is. <laughs> this was the 1970s savings and loan scandal. So prior to 1980, Banks that were not a part of the Federal Reserve were not members of the FDIC. Do you guys all know what FDIC stands for? Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So FDIC is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. It is actually run by the Federal Reserve System. It's an offshoot. And you may have known that there was another similar agency back in the 1970s called the FSLIC. <laughs> Guess what that was? The Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation. Right? This was actually not run by the Fed. It was just a separate company that was insuring or taking out insurance policies for savings and loan industries. And when there was the big, huge run on the savings and loan scandals, where a whole ton of savings and loans banks went belly up, the FSLIC ran out of money. <laughs> so all these people who were investing money into the savings and loan industries lost a lot of their money because the FLIC, FSLIC went broke. Right? Well, it, it, the, the key here is realizing that these were savings and loans. They weren't banks. And so they weren't technically underneath the Federal Reserve System prior to 1980. They actually weren't even part of the system. I mean, they were loosely governed only by dictates and mandates, but not by law. OK, but it, 1980, right? So, so this is the, the Federal SNL Insurance Corporation. And it went belly up in 1980. And so what happened is actually the FDIC stepped in and said, OK, I do have enough money to cover all these savings and loans crashes. So we'll, we'll protect all of the consumers that were investing in them and give them at least some, most of the money that they had invested in the savings and loans. Not all of it. They still had to lose about 20%. All right, so imagine, if you will, that in the United States, there you know, say 15 to 20% of the population lost 20% of their money. What do you think happened to the economy? <laughs> went right down the shitter, folks. It, obviously, it was a bad thing for the economy. We had a you know next mini recession there in the late 70s. That's where one of the big things came from. So what happened in 1980 was that uh, it wasn't Reagan yet. Who's, so, so who's 1980s president? I think it was Carter. Well, anyways, whichever president it was passed the 1980 Monetary Control Act. What it did.
is it broaden the power of the Fed? So the Fed was given oversight of all of the banking institutions. And banking institutions, now it wasn't just strictly banks. It was savings and loans. It was thrift shops. It was also credit unions. All of these types of banking institutions, any institution that could receive deposits, create checking accounts, and make loans were now governed by the Fed, period. All right? That was a huge deal back then. The other thing about it, right? Uh, that uh, it used to be that savings and loans and credit unions and thrift shops could not borrow money from the Fed because they weren't members of the Fed. You could only borrow from the Fed if you were an active member. And there were only 40% of the banks that were active members. Well, what, the, the, what the, this Monetary Control Act did was said, look, screw that crap. You don't have to be a member anymore. We don't care. If the Fed's going to control you, you have the right to borrow money from the Fed. Right? You can hit what's called the discount window, which we'll talk about in Chapter 19 that explains what the discount window is. But basically what it meant was that any of these institutions could borrow money from the Fed. And the Fed's, you know, they don't need to, the Fed doesn't need to get rich. So the Fed's going to charge you interest, but it's, it's usually a teeny amount. Okay? And so that tends to be nice for an institution to be able to borrow money from the Fed so that they can lend it out for a lot higher percentage and make profit. Right? Now, there were a couple of other minor things that they did. And this was just to appease the two different industries that they were regoverning that was allowing these sorts of things to happen, right? So one of the things that the Fed was doing was it was it had put a cap on interest rates. It removed it, right? So back in the 1970s, in order to try and curb inflation, the Fed said interest rates can't go above 14.5%, period. And so a lot of these non-member banks, like credit unions, savings, and loans, were giving depositors interest rates that were above that 14.5% limit. And so what banks were doing was hurting because depositors were going to these savings and loans instead and earning more interest. Right? In addition, what it did was allowed all institutions all banking privileges. In other words, if you think about it, a savings and loan, by its name, the idea is that it's, it's meant to do savings and loans, and that's it. They actually didn't allow savings and loans to have checking accounts. You couldn't invest your money in a savings and loan institution and have it go into a checking account. It just that was, that was by law. They wouldn't let them happen. Right. Again, the idea was that the Fed was saying only member banks get to have checking accounts because that's one of its jobs. So it was only going to clear checks for people who were members. Well, if you're going to control them and you're going to uh, allow them to borrow money from you, they should also be able to do anything that a, a bank does. So they, you know, they could do checking accounts. They could have direct access to US savings bonds, et cetera, et cetera. All the things that a bank could do, now a credit union could do, a savings and loan could do, a thrift shop store could do as well. All right, and this is what gave the Fed the true power that it has now, because the Fed controls all banking institutions. Right? They dictate how much the bank has to hold in reserves. They dictate how much the debt to equity ratio has to be for every one of these things. Right? So if you have you know, if you've got $100 million in the Fed says you must have at least 75% of that in assets, period. Or you start paying pe penalties and fines. All right, so this, this Monetary Control Act was scary at the same time because it gave the Fed the power that it has now, the ability to truly manipulate the economy. And again, we'll talk more about that in Chapter 19. 
because that's where we will spend most of our time discussing how the Fed fixes the economy in a way that's different than the, the government, but still trying to do the same things. So, homework in chapter 18, that's not a big one, just a relatively you know, keep you on your toes thing. And number eight is an opinion question. I'm not, there is no right or wrong answer to, to, the, to the question number eight. I just want you to give me your opinion. I have actually not given you my opinion on that question right now because I want you to come up with your own answer. And then on Wednesday, I will kind of give you mine. No, no, no. The quiz on Wednesday is just on 16 and 17. Yeah, it's just on taxes and then on debt. Thank you.